Stone Brothers Production. Welcome back to the Serial Killer series by United States A through Z. This episode will be about eight serial killers in Arizona. I hope you enjoyed my last few episodes, but let's begin. Number eight, duo serial killers Cynthia Lynn Kaufman and James Gregory Marlowe. Kaufman was born in St. Louis, Missouri, raised by her mother after her father left the picture. Kaufman's mother attempted to give her and her brother away at one point. She was married at the age of 18 and became a mother at a young age. It was too early to marry, so the marriage didn't last long. She moved to Arizona with a friend who took her down the wrong path. Her friend's name is James Marlowe, which left Jill not long after meeting her for the move up to Arizona. She had become married with Marlowe and adapted his addicting traits soon after, meth being their drug of choice. She met him through jail of her boyfriend that was in Arizona. She met Marlowe when he was in jail for the theft of his sixth wife's car when Cynthia walked into his wasted life. Marlowe was born in 1957 and he has been dedicated thief from age 10 for a series of home invasions and knife point robberies. He served three years on conviction, earning himself a reputation as the Folsom Wolf. He proudly wears his tattoos of the neo-Nazi Aryan Brotherhood, most likely because of his troubled past and they act as another family. He and Kaufman moved in with many of his relatives, staying with each one as long as possible, stealing their valuables when they are kicked out and throughout the stay of each family member. When they ran out of family to call for help, they started staying in the woods. They became sick of living in the woods and they began burglarizing homes around Whitley County, Kentucky. After that, they moved out west to California. This is when they started to take a dark path, killing their victims when robbery wasn't enough to spark their drug-induced highs. Sandra Neary being the first victim, she left her home to go to the ATM but never returned. They found her car in a local parking lot and found her strangled, decomposing corpse found by hikers near Corona, Riverside County. Pamela Simmons, age 35, was the next to die. She was reported missing in Bullhead City, Arizona on October 28th. Her car was found abandoned near a police headquarters. Police theorized that her body was snatched the same way after coming back from an ATM machine curbside to avoid detection from the ATM hidden cameras. Ten days after, on November 7th, 20-year-old Karina Novis vanished on a similar errand in Redlands, California. She was kidnapped in broad daylight in an urban shopping mall. 19-year-old Lionel Murray was the next victim. She was kidnapped where her car was found abandoned next to a dry cleaning shop where she worked in Orange County, California. Her body was found naked and strangled in a Huntington Beach motel room. In addition to kidnapping and murder, there was also evidence of sexual assault. At this point, police were praying for a break. First, Karina Novis checkbook was found in a Laguna Niguel trash dumpster, tucked inside a fast food takeout bag with papers bearing the name of Cynthia Kaufman and James Marlowe. Around the same time, Marlowe and Kaufman were linked to a San Bernardino motel room where the manager found stationary bearing practice signatures of Lionel Murray's name. A glance at Marlowe's criminal record did the rest. A statewide alert was issued for both fugitives. They were found later at a mountain lodge at Big Bear City, California, where the owner called a hundred-man search of the lodge commenced. They were found hiking along a mountain road. They surrendered without a fight and were found wearing dry clean outfits stolen from Lionel Murray's workplace. They finally found Karina Novis sodomized and strangled lying in a shallow grave thanks to the help of Kaufman's confession and fingerprints found at the scene. Kaufman was convicted on four counts of murder and Marlowe was convicted on five counts of murder including his hand in the hit of Gary Hill. Both were sentenced to death. Marlowe was sentenced to death on August 30th, 1989 and Kaufman was sentenced a day after on August 31st, 1989. Cynthia Kaufman thus became the first woman sentenced to die in California since that state restored capital punishment under a new statute in 1977. Number 7. Corey Dion Morris, aka Crackhead Killer. I couldn't find anything on his early life, although there is a great deal of what he did as a serial killer. Morris lured his first victim back to his trailer with a motive of money for sexual services, but he had other intentions. The victim had recently been released from prison and was taking medication for their addiction of heroin. While engaging in sexual intercourse, Morris wrapped a tie around the victim's throat and strangled her to death. 
Morris kept the body for some time, using it for sexual gratification. Eventually, he put her body in an alley near his trailer. He also did the same thing with others and strangled others with his bare hands. Worse being a mental patient, which was strangled to death and repeatedly raped. Corey always came up with two different stories with the cops saying that they were drug addicts and died from overdose. Cops didn't believe that story and he comes up with that they wanted to be strangled and they all died. Cops took his words in consideration and Corey Dion Morris was arrested. He was carrying Codman's social security card, driver's license, and his check card in his wallet. Kaufman was a victim in the serial killer's count of bodies. In the end, Corey Dion Morris was sentenced to death on July 19, 2005. Number 6. John Martini Sr. There wasn't much I can find on the early life of Martini Sr., but he was described as a mobster who slain many victims over 12 years hiding in the shadows of police at the time of 1977 through 1989. And since 1995, he asked the courts to permit him to stop his appeals and bring his execution date closer because he had found prison existence intolerable. However, with less than six weeks to go before his appointment with the death chamber, Martini changed his mind and decided that he does not want to die, resuming his appeals. Since his death sentence, Martini has been convicted on three other murders in Arizona and Philadelphia. In January of 1987, Martini allegedly killed his aunt and her husband at their home in Atlantic City, although these are crimes for which he was never brought to trial. He subsequently divorced his wife Alice and leaves his home in Glendale, Arizona where he worked in a bar to return to the Bronx, his birthplace. In November of 1988, Martini killed Teresa Dempster, age 27, a suspect drug supplier, and a salesman Devard Richard Uhl, age 42, near Glendale. In January of 1989, Martini abducted warehouse executive Irving Flax in Fairlawn. Evidently an acquaintance from years past, then collected $25,000 in ransom from his wife, Marilyn, at a Paramus diner. The following day, Flax was found dead in a car in a mall parking lot, shot three times in the head. Martini and his girlfriend remained in the media area where two days later they were recognized and arrested by Fort Lee police at a local motel. In November of 1990, Martini was tried for this murder. He did not deny the crime but blamed the drug addiction. Alice came from Arizona to testify. He was convicted and sentenced to death in December 1990. In April of 1991, a jury convicted girlfriend, Therese Afdal, of felony murder and charges in Flack's death, but not the maximum murder charge. Part of her defense was the claim Martini had beaten her and intimidated her. She was sentenced to 50 years. In August of 1992, Martini pled guilty in Arizona to the Dempster Ole murders in a deal to spare him the death penalty. He got 50 years. In 1994, Martini was moved to a 114-year-old Holmesburg prison in Philadelphia to stand trial for a fourth murder charge. It is there he decided death was preferable to life behind bars. In October of 1995, he told Superior Court Judge Bruce Gaeta, who handled his trial, that he wants to die and wants all appeals stopped. A psychiatrist subsequently testified Martini was competent to understand the choices he made. In November of 1997, Martini was convicted in Philadelphia of the execution-style murder of Annie Mary Pauli Duvall, with whom he had business dealings in 1977 near the airport. Number 5. Dale Sean Hosner and Samuel Dietman Dale Hosner worked as a custodian in Phoenix Sky Harbor International Airport since 1999 at the age of 31, as well as a boxing photojournalist for Ring Sports and FightNews.com. Samuel Dietman had a history of petty crimes by the age of 31, and he already was a model citizen in policemen's eyes. He had moved away from Minnesota to leave to Arizona a few years after, meeting Hosner through Hosner's brother while living in Arizona for the time. Hosner stated his brother introduced him to Dietman, age 30, six months ago. About a month ago, he said he let Dietman move into his apartment because he felt sorry for the guy who had no job or home. Hoster and Dietman had similar views and started a belief of their own which included shooting in random locations both known as serial shooters and spawn a legion of other serial shooters like Phoenix Freeway shootings 
series of shootings in 2015 along Interstate 10 in Phoenix. Mary Vale's serial shooter was another soon after mimicking the predecessors. They started their carnage in the streets of Tullison on June 29th and July 20th, shooting David Estrada, two horses, and a dog to death, one horse being wounded and surviving. On November 11th, Nathaniel Schaffner was shot to death trying to protect his dogs. Both dogs survived with injuries. December 29th to December 30th, four dogs and three people were shot, most of them fatally, and out of four of the dogs, one died. By this time, it was turning to 2006 and over six people have died. Two near the end of 2005 included on the list is Jose Ortiz and Marco Carrillo. Throughout May of 2006, over five people were shot at by the duo and one being stabbed in a parking lot and surviving. Most of the shot victims survived and one being Claudia Gutierrez Cruz was shot to death while walking in Scottsdale. Throughout June and July were the most active times for the shooters. Both shot over 11 more victims in arsenic fires of two Walmart stores that caused approximately 7 to $10 million in damage. Robin Blasnick at the age of 22 was fatally shot to death while walking in Mesa. According to the reports, police first identified Dale Hosner and Samuel Dietman as suspects on July 31, 2006, through tips received from the community, mainly from Ron Horton. On August 3rd of 2006, police arrested both suspects outside of their apartment in Mesa, Arizona, a suburb of Phoenix. Both were charged with over 23 drive-by shootings, 6 to 8 murders split between both criminals, 18 first-degree murder charges, 9 animal cruelty charges, and other various charges using arson, fires, and gunshots at an occupied structure. Hosner tried to plead that he wasn't involved in any of the shootings and that Dietman did everything by stealing his weapons and cars. Unfortunately for his appeals, the cops have phone transcripts between the two each time they talked about the crimes they've committed and bragged about it amongst each other. Hosner, being the worst, got charged with six death penalty charges. He committed suicide in jail and Dietman was sentenced to life without parole. Number 4. Robert Wayne Danielson Jr. A native of Lowell, Oregon, Daniels was convicted on manslaughter in 1970 winning parole of his sentence in 1981. Within a year, he had stopped checking in with his parole officer at Eugene, and New Oregon warrants charged him with a parole violation. He passed bad checks, drove with a suspended license, and committed many robberies. After all these crimes, more serious charges arose amongst the service, making Daniels a suspect with at least six homicides and two attempted murders. The first to die on December 10, 1981, were 60-year-old Harold Pratt and his wife Betty, age 55. The Tucson residents were camping out on Arizona's desert, 75 miles southeast of Phoenix, when they were robbed and shot in the back of the head, execution style. Their body left as food for scavenging predators. On June 25, 1982, 62-year-old Arthur Gray Jr. was killed in a similar fashion at Twin Springs Campground, 80 miles east of Eugene, Oregon. The following month, Arizona residents Benjamin and Edith Schaefer, both in their 60s, were robbed and shot to death in Mendocino County, California, their bodies lying undiscovered through December 1983. Ernest Coral, age 38, was the victim in November 1982, shot execution style and dumped in a desert ravine near his hometown of Apache Junction, Arizona. There had also been survivors of the murder spree with Edwin and Ida Davis, both 64, reporting that they were befriended by a younger couple near El Cajun, California, in March of 1982. On March 22nd, Edwin and Ida were overpowered by their friends, injected with a powerful horse tranquilizer, and left to die. But they were discovered in time for physicians to save their lives. Recuperating from their ordeal, both identified Robert Danielson from Mugshocks as one of their attackers. On February 9, 1984, an all-points bulletin was issued on Danielson, accompanied by a federal warrant charging unlawful flight to avoid prosecution in Oregon. Formally charged in the Gray and Schaefer homicides, he remained a suspect in several other cases while investigations were continuing. FBI agents traced Danielson to his job with a traveling carnival, then playing in Odessa, Texas. He was arrested without incident and returned to Oregon for trial.
facing a maximum sentence of a life imprisonment in a state where the death penalty had been abolished. Number three, Mark Odo, aka Baseline Rapist. Mark terrorized the Phoenix metro area between August 2005 and June 2006. He was first referred to as a baseline rapist when the Phoenix police first announced that a light-skinned black man was sexually assaulting as young as 12-year-old girls at gunpoint. He was later considered baseline killer in spring of 2006, being linked to a number of murders and armed robberies. He was on community supervision with Arizona Department of Corrections after being paroled in 2004. He once blamed his history of violence on a weakness for crack cocaine. Godot had a lot of family troubles as a kid that were plagued by drugs and alcohol abuse. Also, he grew up with 12 other children, which 6 of them are felons and 4 of them did prison time. His neighbors thought of him being really sweet and a hard worker, in which they didn't think of him being a serial killer at the time. His first murder was in September 8, 2005, and his choice of method is shooting for the serial killer. Godot's killing spree ended on September 7, 2006, and was accused of sexually assaulting two sisters, which one was visibly pregnant in 2005 of September. On September 7, 2007, he was convicted on 19 counts related to sexual assault. Godot was charged soon after with 94 crimes in all, including 9 counts of first-degree murder, 15 counts of sexual assault, and 11 counts of kidnapping. He pled not guilty to those charges. On December 7, 2007, he was found guilty and was sentenced to 438 years in prison. Number 2. Duo serial killers Douglas Gretzler and Willie Steelman A native of the Bronx, born in 1951, Douglas Gretzler was drifting aimlessly around the country where he met 28-year-old Willie Steelman on October 11, 1973. Once committed to a mental institution, Steelman had compiled a lengthy record of arrests around Lodi, California, serving prison time on conviction of forgery. He recognized a kindred soul on site, and soon the men became inseparable, trolling the southwest in their search for victims, stealing to finance their travels, and Steelman's heroin addiction. It started on October 28, 1973, when the two men entered a house trailer in Mesa, Arizona, and shot to death a young couple who lived there. Then they traveled to Tucson, Arizona, and killed a young man leaving his body in the desert before returning to the city to murder another couple in their apartment. As they left and drove into the desert, they found a man in a sleeping bag and killed him as well. In Phoenix, they grabbed two more young men, stripped and killed both of them, leaving their bodies in California. Arizona authorities knew who they were looking for and quickly issued warrants. On November 6, this spree killing team hit again, but this time nine victims all at once. They went to a house where 18-year-old was babysitting Walter and Joanne Parkins' two children. The sitter's parents had dropped by along with her brother and fiancé, and then the Parkins came home. The killer shot them all, leaving the Parkin couple in their bed and stuffing the rest of the bodies and into a closet. Collectively, these nine people were shot 25 times. Two days later, the killers were apprehended at a motel because the stolen car tags had been traced to them. When police traced the vehicle, they found the bodies of University of Arizona students Michael and Patricia Sandberg. The couple who had recently told their families they planned to have a baby had been bound, gagged, and shot to death. Gretzler told the police and described the other crimes and where all the bodies were. Convicted in two trials in two states, they were sentenced to die in Arizona. Steelman died in prison. Gretzler was executed in 1998. Both killed over 9 victims confirmed, and 17 others being confessed by Gretzler. Gretzler apologized to the families of the victims before his execution in 1998, regretting ever starting the killing spree with Willie Steelman. Number 1. Randy Grenewalt Randy Grenewalt was sentenced to life after slaying a trucker who was asleep in his cab in an Interstate 40 rest stop near Winslow. Also, four other truck drivers by shooting them in the head while they were sleeping in their trucks. This is one of the reasons why they have securities at rest stops in America now. Grinnewalt drew an X on the trucker's door near his head, then fired around through it. Grinnewalt later confessed to killing another trucker in Arkansas and a man in Colorado. Transferred to the low security trustee unit for excellent behavior, Tyson and Grinnewalt pulled off their daring escape in broad daylight. They were aided by Gary's younger and brainwashed sons, Donnie, Ricky, and Ray. 
The next night, they kidnapped and killed a Yuma family and stole their car. The bodies of Marine Sergeant John Linus, age 24, and their little boy Christopher were found near the fugitive's abandoned car. The body of the couple's niece, Theresa Tyson, age 15, was found later, a quarter mile away. They then drove north, changing cars several times, and apparently murdered a newlywed couple, James and Marjean Judge, in Colorado. On August 11, 1978, the Tysons and Greenwald were back in Arizona driving the judge's stolen van. They ran one roadblock but were stopped at a second. Police killed one of Tyson's son and Tyson fled into the desert where he died of exposure. Grunewald and the surviving sons Raymond and Ricky Tyson were captured, tried, and sentenced to death. The Tyson's death sentence were overturned by the state Supreme Court in 1992 and they were resentenced to life in prison. Grunewald's lawyer had argued in appeals that the state's use of lethal injection was cruel and unusual punishment but they couldn't overturn the death penalty on Grunewald and he died on January 23rd, 1997. I hope you enjoyed yourself on this episode of the Serial Killer series. The next episode will be up in about a week and a new tutorial video will be up in the next few days. Let me know any suggestions on making my video better. Please subscribe, like, comment, and share the video if you'd like to spread the word. I greatly appreciate all the feedback and have a great rest of your day.